Hello everybody, this video is on the measurement of the speed of light and its current relationship to the measurement of time and distance. Experiments that measure the speed of light can be divided into historical and contemporary methods. Historical methods were the ones that were conducted before the 20th century and contemporary methods were mostly conducted in the 20th century and were made possible by technology and newer understandings of light. In this video, we'll discuss each method in detail. Ole Roma was a Danish astronomer studying the motion of Io, one of the moons of Jupiter. Roma noticed that the orbital period of Io around Jupiter was different throughout the year. In other words, the time taken for Io to orbit Jupiter changes as Earth orbits the Sun. Now, of course, the actual or the true orbital period of Io would not change. So Roma explained that this discrepancy in time was due to the finite speed of light. The apparent orbital period, that is what's being observed by Roma, depends on Earth's relative motion with respect to Jupiter. When Earth is moving away from Jupiter, a longer observed orbital period will be measured, and vice versa, when Earth is moving towards Jupiter, a shorter observed period will be measured. What you're looking at here is a simplified diagram of Roma's work. This will help you understand why the relative velocity of Earth will determine the length or the duration of the apparent orbital period of Io. What's shown here on the left-hand side is Earth's orbit around the Sun, and on the right-hand side it's Io's orbit around Jupiter. Position C marks when Io will disappear into the shadow of Jupiter, and this is referred to as immersion. Position D marks the location where Io will appear out of Jupiter again, and this is called immersion. Roma was able to estimate the orbital period of Io by observing when Io appears out of the shadow, orbits around Jupiter, and then re-disappears behind the shadow at position C. Now, suppose Earth is at position L when Roma sees the event of immersion at position D. So light has to travel from D to L for Roma to observe this event. Now, let's just say Earth is stationary. So some time goes by, and when Io disappears behind Jupiter, so that's when immersion occurs, light then travels from Jupiter all the way to L, and this is when Roma was able to record the event and therefore estimate the orbital period of Io. Now, in a real-life scenario, of course, the event of immersion is measured when Earth is at L, and as Io is orbiting around Jupiter, Earth is also orbiting around the Sun. So then in this time, it will move from L and let's say it goes to K. Of course, this is slightly exaggerated. So when Io undergoes immersion, the light has to travel not just to L now, but it has to traverse a longer distance to reach K. And this is where Roma was able to observe the event of immersion. And by recording this event, he was able to measure the apparent orbital period of Io. But as you can see, because light has to travel this slightly longer distance over here, it's called a D, the time taken for light to reach to K will also be slightly longer. This is the reason why Roma saw that the observed orbital period was slightly longer than usual. By the same logic, if the event of immersion was recorded at position F, and as Earth is orbiting towards Jupiter from F to G, as Io is orbiting Jupiter, when it gets to G, Roma records the event of immersion. In this situation, a shorter observed orbital period will be recorded because now light from immersion has to travel a shorter distance, which means it takes shorter time. And that means Roma was able to see the event at an earlier time point. So when Earth is neither moving towards nor away from Jupiter, there's no change in the apparent orbital period. And this will be the shortest observed period that Roma has made. This is because the time taken by light to travel to Earth for the observation of the first eclipse will be identical to the time for the second eclipse. Since the time is the same, there is no delay or deviation in the observed orbital period. So the measured period here will be the actual period of Io. Similarly, the time taken for light to reach Earth will be also identical if Earth is at the furthest point from Jupiter. Because in this position, Earth will have no relative velocity to Jupiter. 
However, it is worth noting that Roma was not able to record any observations when Earth was in this position because the view would have been obstructed by the sun. When the measurement is made as Earth is moving away from Jupiter, Roma observed a longer orbital period. This is because the time taken for light to travel to Earth when the second measurement was taken, that is when the end of the orbit period was recorded, would be slightly longer than the first measurement due to the distance that's traversed by Earth as Io is orbiting around Jupiter. Due to the poor methods of timekeeping in the 17th century, Roma was unable to accurately measure the time deviation between successive orbits of Io, as this was on a scale of a few seconds. However, he measured the difference in period of multiple orbits and found that the largest total difference observed was 22 minutes. In other words, the time deviation of successive orbits of Io accumulated to a maximum of 22 minutes. This time difference corresponded to the time taken by light to traverse the diameter of Earth's orbit around the Sun. As such, an estimation of light's speed was made by dividing the diameter of Earth around the Sun by 22 minutes. I want to quickly clarify that, that the deviation in the apparent orbital period of Io is actually not dependent on the distance between Earth and Jupiter. This is a common misconception. But rather, this is dependent on the relative motion of Earth with respect to Jupiter. A different apparent orbital period will be observed if there is a difference in time taken for light to travel to Earth for the first and second observation of the eclipse. If the measurement is made when Earth is moving away, that is receding away from Jupiter, then this will result in a longer apparent orbital period. Vice versa, if Earth was approaching Jupiter, then a shorter apparent orbital period will be observed. Roma's estimation of light speed is important to know and understand because it was the first quantitative estimation of light speed, and it showed that light speed was finite rather than infinite. However, his calculation was fairly inaccurate as it deviated substantially from the true value due to two main reasons. The actual time difference in Io's orbital period was actually shorter than 22 minutes, which is what Roma had thought. Because of this, his calculated value was smaller than the true value. Second, at the time, the knowledge of Earth's orbital diameter was also inaccurate which would have affected the accuracy of Roman's calculations. The second historical method was by James Bradley, who was also an astronomer. Bradley observed the varying position of stars in the night sky throughout different times of the year. He noticed that the position of the stars relative to the background stars changed throughout different months of the year. This phenomenon is called stellar aberration. Bradley explained that stellar aberration was due to the relative motion of Earth, which caused the relative velocity of light from distant stars to change. As a result, the angle at which light from these stars reach Earth also changes. By considering the angle of starlight and the relative velocity of Earth, Bradley calculated the speed of light. You do not need to know the details of these calculations, but the difference between the two angles, that is theta, is the angle the true position of the star makes versus phi, which is the angle at which a stellar aberration occurs, is approximately equal to Earth's relative velocity divided by the speed of light. A good analogy that is often used to understand stellar aberration is to compare the falling motion of rain when a person is either standing still or moving. Suppose that the rain in this example is falling vertically. To a station observer, this will be the case and they will need to hold their umbrella upright to avoid getting wet. When the person starts to move in the direction, let's say to the right, the rain with respect to the observer or the person will be falling at an angle. In this situation, the person needs to hold the umbrella at an angle to avoid getting wet. As a person's relative velocity increases, let's say from V to 2V, the angle at which the rainfall is perceived or observed also increases. Light traveling from stars is affected by the same way as the rain in this example. 
The angle at which starlight is observed depends on the magnitude of Earth's relative velocity. So Bradley was able to use the angle between starlight and the relative velocity to calculate how fast light was traveling. Fizel conducted the first terrestrial experiment to measure the speed of light. A beam of light was passed through a gap between the teeth of a toothed cogwheel. So this diagram here, this is a toothed cogwheel. The beam of light traveled in a straight line and was reflected of a mirror that was placed roughly eight kilometers away. While this is happening, the toothed cogwheel is rotating at an increasing angular velocity until the returning light from the mirror cannot pass through the cogwheel because it is blocked by the tooth that was adjacent to the gap that the light first passed through. So the wheel was spun at an increasing angular velocity until the returning light is blocked by the adjacent tooth. Due to the finite speed of light, the angular velocity at which this will occur will be a very specific value. So Fizel tried this many times until he could determine the correct angular velocity for the cogwheel to allow the return of light to be blocked. He then used the angular velocity to calculate the time taken for light to return from the mirror. We know that the angular velocity of the cogwheel is equal to the angle at which it traverses divided by the amount of time taken. So if we know the angular velocity of the cogwheel and we can measure the angle between the gap through which the light first passed through and the adjacent tooth that blocked the light, we can then calculate the time taken, which will be equal to delta theta divided by the angular speed omega. Once Fizel calculated the time, by dividing the distance traveled by light, that is roughly two times eight kilometers, which is 16 kilometers, as the light has to travel from the cogwheel to the mirror and back. So this is 16 kilometers divided by the time taken, which was calculated by the cogwheel's angular speed. And this gave Fizel the value of light speed. It is important to be aware that Fizel's method involved an experimental setup that was designed to measure the light speed. It was taking place on a much smaller scale compared to previous two methods, which relied on astronomical observations. This is the reason why the result from this method was far more valid and accurate. Leon Foucault conducted a similar experiment at Fizel. Instead of using a rotating cogwheel, Foucault used a rotating mirror to measure the light's time of flight. His experimental setup looked something like this. A light source was directed at the rotating mirror, which then reflected a light ray to a distant stationary mirror. And of course, this mirror then reflected a light ray back to the rotating mirror. Again, because light travels at a finite speed, by the time the light has returned from the stationary mirror, the position or the angle of this rotating mirror would have been slightly different compared to before. In other words, the mirror would have already rotated by a small angle. As a result, the newly reflected light ray that's coming back to the rotating mirror will then travel a different path to the original light ray. So this is the original light ray, and this is the newly reflected light ray from the rotating mirror when it has reached a different angle. By measuring the angle between these two light rays, let's call that theta, the time taken by light to travel from the rotating mirror to the stationary mirror and back can be determined. As we saw in Fizel's experiment, the time of flight taken by light to travel will be given by the angle displacement of the rotating mirror, so this is delta theta, divided by the angular velocity of the mirror. Foucault then used the time of flight value and the distance between the two mirrors, as you can see here. So this in the diagram should be two times by d because light has to travel to the mirror and back. He then divided the distance by the time to calculate light speed. In addition, Foucault repeated the experiment by passing light through a body of water, and he found that light speed was actually slower in water compared to air. I talk about the significance of this finding in the video on Newton's and Huygens' models of light. The first contemporary method was by Rosa and Dorsey, who used Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism to calculate the speed of light. In its own video, I discuss Maxwell's theory on electromagnetism in more detail.
So Maxwell proposed that a speed of light is given by 1 divided by the square root of mu naught and epsilon naught. Mu naught is the magnetic permeability constant, so that's 4 pi times 10 to the power minus 7. And epsilon naught is the electric permittivity constant, and that is 8.854 times 10 to the power of minus 12. Rosa and Dorsey determined the values of these two constants and therefore was able to use them to calculate the light speed. And this yielded a value of 2.99796 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. This method differed from the previous methods as it did not require measurement of the light time of flight. Rather, it used an understanding of electromagnetic waves by Maxwell to calculate the value of C. Another contemporary method to determine the light speed was laser interferometry. In this method, a laser source is fired at a half-sealed mirror which splits the light ray into two perpendicular rays that travel to two station mirrors and back. These two mirrors are equal distance from the half-sealed mirror. So the time taken by light to travel to the mirror and back should be identical for the two light rays. Now, when the two light rays meet again at the half sealed mirror when they return, they will undergo constructive interference as they are in phase. And this will result in a new wave that has double the amplitude compared to the waves that have been split. The same experiment is repeated, but this time one of the two mirrors is moved back. When the mirror is moved back by exactly half a wavelength of the light, that's half lambda, it will cause the two waves to undergo destructive interference. Because by the time this light ray travels back to the harvest mirror, they will be out of phase compared to the other light ray. When I say out of phase, what I mean by that is that the trough of one light ray will meet the crest of another light ray. And this will result in destructive interference resulting in no waves being observed. In laser interferometry, the laser source has a known frequency, and the wavelength of laser is measured by determining the distance by which the stationary mirror needs to be moved back by to cause the destructive interference. The distance by which the mirror has to be pushed back by is exactly half lambda. So if we can figure the distance that it has moved by, then we can multiply the distance by two, to calculate the value for lambda. Light speed is then calculated by multiplying the frequency of the laser and the wavelength that was determined by interferometry. The current definition of distance and time are related to light speed. Specifically, they are defined by light speed. The modern definition of one meter is the distance traveled by light in one over C seconds. The definition of one second is also defined in terms of light speed. It's a time taken for light to travel C meters. The reason for this is because in a theory of special relativity, light speed is defined as a constant value regardless of the frame of reference or where the observer is measuring it from. And distance and time therefore become relative quantities that will change in value depending on the observer's point of view. I talk more about the relativity of distance and time in the video on special relativity. And this concludes the video on the measurement of speed of light.